Well, there's some smart money to be had in 50 minutes here on One as we try and hack our way into a bank's computer and pull off the ultimate fraud in our Sunday premiere. First, the news on BBC One with Jan Leeming. Geoffrey Archer resigns as deputy chairman of the Conservative Party. The newspaper that alleged he tried to pay a prostitute to leave the country. For Mrs. Thatcher, a political upset she could do without. Knowlesley North Labour Party still go on defying the national executive. And the pandas of China on safari with the Duke of Edinburgh. Geoffrey Archer, deputy chairman of the Conservative Party, has handed in his resignation after allegations in a Sunday newspaper. The News of the World said he'd offered a prostitute money to leave the country in an attempt to avoid a possible scandal. In a statement issued today, Mr Archer strongly denied ever having even met the woman involved. But he said she'd contacted him several times, and in order to stop possibly damaging publicity, he offered her money. He says... Foolishly, as I now realise, I allowed myself to fall into what I can only call a trap. And he adds, for that lack of judgment, and that alone, I have tendered my resignation. Party chairman Norman Tebbett said he very much regretted the loss of Mr Archer from the Conservative Central Office team. His energy and enthusiasm will be greatly missed, he said. Geoffrey Archer left his London flat this afternoon, his political career in... The man who resigned his seat in Parliament 12 years ago when his business affairs went wrong had resigned again, as party deputy chairman this time, because of newspaper allegations that he offered money to a prostitute, Monica Coughlin, to avoid a scandal. Monica, who it's alleged operated as a prostitute in London's Shepherd Market, rang Geoffrey Archer seven weeks ago to tell him that one of her clients was spreading stories that she and Archer had had an association. Archer, in his Thameside penthouse flat, said he'd never met Monica, but arranged for her to meet a close friend of his, here at the entrance to number three platform at Victoria Station. The friend, PR man Michael Stackpool, had an estimated £2,000 in £50 notes, but Monica, who was meant to go abroad with the money, refused it. At the Grosvenor Hotel nearby, sitting in the Edwards Bar, Stackpool tried to persuade her to take the money, which would keep her away from the press and avoid extremely harmful publicity for Mr Archer. Until he's consulted lawyers, Michael Stackpool won't talk about the alleged payoff on behalf of his close friend, Geoffrey Archer. I'm very sad that he's had to resign, and I sincerely hope that once it's all over, which I hope it is now, that he'll get back to normal and that once again he will make good, as I'm sure he will do. Today, after the publication of the story, Mr Archer's wife Mary went to church near the Cambridgeshire home they share with their two children. Mr Archer, pressure for his resignation growing, was in London. Mr Archer resigned just before one o'clock. In his statement, he said that he had never, repeat, never met Monica, nor had he ever had any association of any kind with a prostitute. Mr Archer went on, foolishly, as I now realise, I allowed myself to fall into what I can only call a trap, in which a newspaper, in my view, played a reprehensible part. As the news of the world were repeating, they stood by their story, the former deputy chairman of the Conservative Party was arriving back home in Cambridgeshire, having picked up his family at another house nearby and then forgetting to help his wife from the car. Although Mr Archer was prepared to pose for the photographers, he wasn't prepared to talk about his resignation. Now, my solicitor made a statement earlier this afternoon, and you should have it yesterday. I'm really rather, rather sad. And how does your husband say you think? Also rather sad. Then, with a quick reprimand for photographers treading on his flower beds, Mr Archer was gone. Another chapter in his eventful life at a close. Mr Archer, who's also a successful author, had been deputy chairman for just over a year. He made a number of controversial statements to start with, but has since proved his value as a leading Tory party campaigner. Geoffrey Archer's dramatic and abrupt resignation is a damaging blow for the government.
but senior ministers and MPs, relieved that he resigned at once, hope that what they see as an unfortunate episode will be forgotten quickly and won't cause lasting damage. Given the publication of the sensational allegations, Mr Archer had to decide between continuing or quitting. Although he wasn't a member of the government, he was closely involved with the party's grassroots. Their reaction to his resignation, with its echoes of Cecil Parkinson, is going to be crucial. Mrs Thatcher, returning to Downing Street tonight after a weekend at Chequers, had been kept fully informed on the crisis over the man she picked as the Conservative Party Deputy Chairman. She is said to be saddened and sympathetic over what's happened. Mr Archer's former boss, Norman Tebbit, who's been staying in Devon, very much regretted the loss of his deputy. With this unwanted political drama, Conservatives are likely to close ranks and hope to avoid further revelations. They feel they could have done without this in a year which has seen two major resignations from the government. First the walkout of Michael Heseltine in the middle of a cabinet meeting over Westland, and then Leon Britton's resignation a fortnight later on the same issue. Now Geoffrey Archer's gone. He had the knack of rallying the party faithful, and Mrs Thatcher has to find an equally successful replacement at an awkward time for the Conservative Party. Mr Archer's resignation is the latest stage in a career of dramatic ups and downs. A few years after helping to raise over a million pounds for charity, he himself lost nearly half a million on a business venture. Geoffrey Archer soon showed his Midas touch. The Beatles helped him raise his first million pounds for charity. In politics, fiercely ambitious, he began his ascent to power at 29, when he became the youngest MP in the House of Commons. But after the spectacular rise, the fall. Resignation five years later when his city business collapsed, almost bankrupting him. At this low point, he searched for something new to do and settled on writing books. A hugely successful author whose novels have so far earned five million pounds. Ironically, one of them concerning a cabinet minister being blackmailed by a prostitute. His debts were soon replaced with a lavish lifestyle, a penthouse flat near Parliament, a country retreat in Cambridgeshire, where he returns at weekends to his wife Mary and their two children. Impressed by his fight back to the top, Mrs Thatcher last year appointed him as image maker of the Conservative Party. It proved a controversial move since he criticised the unemployed as work shy and made other blunders about Northern Ireland and even the Conservative Party itself. But for all his gaffes, Geoffrey Archer more than proved his worth helping to restore the morale of party members throughout the country, with victory at the next election in mind. More recently, the flamboyance had been curbed for a quieter, more thoughtful approach, though Geoffrey Archer remained haunted that he might lose everything again. Yes, I'm far more cautious nowadays, far more careful, and I certainly wouldn't put all my eggs in one basket. But that causes me to realise it could happen again. I'm pretty determined it won't. Geoffrey Archer, who resigned today, speaking earlier this year. And now the rest of the news. The local Labour Party at Knowlesley North on Merseyside have decided to go back to the High Court tomorrow. They're challenging the right of the party's national executive to impose a candidate, George Howarth, for the forthcoming by-election. They're also challenging the executive's right to bar Les Huckfield, the left-wing Euro MP, from being adopted. Just over half of the constituency's 124 delegates turned out for this afternoon's meeting in Kirby. They were joined by Mr Huckfield. An hour and a half later, they emerged to announce they'd be going ahead with their High Court action to challenge the NEC's decision to bar Mr Huckfield from standing as a candidate in Knowsley North. They'd also be seeking the right to select a candidate of their own choosing. The aim of the action is to ensure that justice is seen to be done and that as a constituency we have our democratic rights under the rules of the Labour Party to select a candidate of our own choice. And party officials in Knowsley are keen to point out that in this particular dispute personalities are not at issue. They're arguing, they say, over a point of principle. Two Labour MPs are demanding an inquiry into the safety of the air traffic control system at Heathrow Airport. It follows the news that two British Airways planes with a total of 100 passengers on board came within 50 feet of a collision in an incident last July. The incident happened in clear weather and it was that which prevented a tragedy. The Boeing 737 coming from Munich 
was heading west at 8,000 feet. The 111 shuttle flight from Edinburgh was heading southeast at the same height. The 737 should have been turned into an S-shaped maneuver to line it up for landing at Heathrow. But the Heathrow controller didn't give the order and for two minutes the planes approached each other, closing at eight miles a minute. They were only seconds apart when the 737 pilot spotted the other plane. He reacted just in time. He pushed the controls forward sharply and just managed to dive under the 111. The 111 pilot didn't even see the Boeing, but they passed at a combined speed of 500 miles an hour, 50 feet apart. That's the sort of distance the Red Arrows use in this daring crossover maneuver, and that's how close they came to disaster. Although an accident hadn't occurred, there was a full investigation. It was found the air traffic controller had been distracted by two visitors. He's since been removed. In South Africa, at least five black mine workers are reported to have been killed in an accident underground. It happened at the Randfontein main mine near Johannesburg when an empty lift plunged more than 2,000 feet to the bottom of a shaft. 32 men were trapped for eight hours until rescue workers were able to reach them. Tonight, the mining company were unable to confirm the number of dead. Britain's Nigel Mansell says he's lucky to be alive after the dramatic incident which robbed him of the World Motor Racing Championship. Mansell was in third place in the Australian Grand Prix and set to take the championship when he blew a tyre. Alain Prost went on to win the Adelaide race and retain his world title. Rangers have won Scottish football's Skull Cup in a controversial match at Hampden Park. Ten players, including seven from Celtic, were booked and Celtic's Mo Johnson was sent off. A penalty from Dave Cooper gave Rangers a 2-1 victory. Rangers opened the scoring 17 minutes into the second half. Which is there. Durant is there and scores. But Celtic drew level thanks to Brian McClare. And it's in a brilliant equaliser. Then, six minutes from time, Cooper struck the winner. After Johnson was sent off, referee David Syme showed the red card to Tony Shepherd. Celtic manager David Hay came on to calm his players. Shepherd stayed on the field and an angry Hay later said, if it was up to me, our application to join the English League would be made tomorrow. The Duke of Edinburgh has been visiting the world's leading panda research centre in Wulong in southwest China. The Duke, who was shown the centre's new baby panda, made the visit as president of the World Wildlife Fund. The struggle to save pandas from extinction is far from over, and the Wulong Reserve is the biggest in China. There are over 70 pandas here in the wild, apart from a small number kept in captivity for breeding. Artificial insemination is one technique being developed at Wolong, but no one's sure whether the latest birth is the successful result. The main threat to pandas' survival is the destruction of their staple diet, the hilltop bamboo forest. The Duke was told China's panda population is still dwindling. An added complication at Wolong is that the pandas share the same mountain slopes with a few thousand hill tribes people. The question of moving the humans out is a sensitive issue. More pictures of the Duke and the pandas can be seen in World Safari on BBC Two now. And that's all from the newsroom tonight. Tomorrow on BBC One there'll be a new lunchtime news programme. The one o'clock news presented by Martin Lewis. The latest news and live interviews with people in the news. That's the new one o'clock news starting tomorrow on BBC One. But now from me for this weekend, good night. Open Air, BBC One's new access programme also starts tomorrow morning. Last week, over 100 Conservative MPs tabled a motion calling for the restoration of the highest professional standards by BBC producers. That issue will be discussed tomorrow by Tim Brinton, MP, Chairman of the Conservative Party Media Committee, and Mark Bonham Carter, a former Vice Chairman of the BBC's Board of Governors. If you'd like to take part in the discussion, the number to ring is 061 814 0424, and the lines are now open. Hello. A fine day, so no surprises.
in today's figures. The south, sunniest and warmest yet again. The north, coldest and wettest. But uh, leaping to Southport's defense, that rain was all last night. These are 24-hour figures, but much more rain to come. These fronts queuing up for the visa to come over, and they will indeed get here. We can't send them back. So lots more rain on the way. Already that rain getting into western districts by the morning, that rain right across to the east coast. But at least it's going to be a mild, if rather breezy night everywhere. Tomorrow, a cloudy start for pretty well all of us, brightening up very quickly in Northern Ireland. Rain in many places, though. But as we go through the day, brighter weather, slightly brighter weather, getting across central and northern parts of Britain, southern parts of England and Wales, though, staying cloudy throughout the day with rain from time to time. And in the north, too, there'll be showers in places as well. Temperatures, well, not too bad at all. Uh, generally about 14 Celsius, 57 degrees Fahrenheit, but in a few places in eastern Scotland and northeast England where they'll get some sunshine, a pleasant 16 degrees Celsius, 61 degrees Fahrenheit. Colder weather is on the way during the week. Finally, a cloudy summary of all that. May I wish you a very good night.